Hello and welcome to my review of Antonia Frazier's King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Antonia Frazier is the daughter of the Earl of Longford, so genuine British aristocracy. She's also known in the UK for novels featuring the detective Jemima Shaw, as well as a handful of biographies of kings, queens and other historical figures. Perhaps King Arthur falls into the latter category. This novel was first published in 1954, but this version of it, proudly crediting its illustrations to Lady Antonia's daughter Rebecca, is from 1971. One assumes the early versions were not illustrated because Rebecca Fraser wasn't born until 1957. In its most basic form, the plot here will be familiar to many. It begins with the end of Uther Pendragon's reign, encapsulates Arthur's childhood with Sir Hector and Kay, and goes on to cover his entire reign, including all the familiar beats such as drawing the sword from the stone and the round table at Camelot. Along the way, there are numerous encounters with rogue knights, with despotic kings and fair maidens, enough to fill a dozen adventures, and there are plenty of adventures here with most chapters, able to be read as standalone or short stories. And there are a lot of characters here as well that are given the lead in them, perhaps more than is the norm in other countless adaptations of this story. Naturally, this lends the novel a rather episodic nature that occasionally relies on the familiarity that most people will have with this world and with the major characters depicted here. The downside to this is that some of the story is not really given enough time to breathe and develop and the various antagonists come and go without any major impact on proceedings. Morgan Le Fay is particularly shortchanged here. Given the alacrity with which these adventures are begun and finished, it's quite easy to see this book as a, a volume of bedtime stories or fairy tales because it is most definitely a children's book even though the publishers might have done a better job explaining what sort of age group it is actually aimed at. The significance of that is that some of these stories are kind of bad, some very dated and some just downright weird. The first of these is exemplified by the story that introduces Galahad. It sits in, in the seats perilous without him having done a thing to earn that honour, ushers him into a quest for the Holy Grail that is over in a flash without any sort of struggle, and poor Sir Galahad is then ushered off to heaven before we had a chance even to get to know him. You can see from the examples on screen that this is a text that's very wordy for a book of bedtime stories. It also includes some rather archaic terminology, and Morgan Le Fay's insults aimed at her protege Vivian are perhaps more suited for the upper end of the young adult market, who I think would probably turn their nose up at a novel that's generally constructed in this way. Because King Arthur is also the sort of book where villains and heroes announce their plans aloud to themselves without a care for who might overhear, and where the dialogue generally comes across dripping with as much melodrama as it does awkwardness. My liege, save us from the Saxons. The south of Britain groans under the heel of the invader and we shall all die of starvation if we survive the massacre. Man the walls, we have no time to lose if we are to survive this onslaught. I can see that Arthur Pendragon is a general to be reckoned with. By far the most egregious sin, however, is that the morals proposed in these vignettes, where they're actually detectable, are sometimes quite questionable as well. What are we to make of chapter 7 and the tragedy of Bors and Balin, twin brothers from Normandy who decide to seek fame and fortune as knights? Bors heads to Ireland and Balin to England. Shortly after, Bors rescues an Irish princess from raiding Vikings. Disguised, they arrive in England and bump into none other than Balin who, thinking they are Vikings, attacks them, killing his brother. He then marries the princess who had previously been in love with Bors. What exactly is the moral to that? Take your brother's stuff if you can beat him in combat? Hey bro, just popping round with my axe. <laughs> oh, no reason. See you in five. Perhaps it's always ID somebody before you murder them. From a purely storing tank perspective as well, this section would also have been improved if the traitor that was helping the Vikings was Morgan Le Fay instead of some nameless innkeeper. Poor brave Isabella as well. She helps Tristan and gets murdered for her trouble. This is a pretty brutal book for kids. One story, Gareth wins his spurs, has a very clear moral. Lynette comes to Arthur for help, but she's so arrogant that none of the knights will help her. Instead, she has to make do with Gareth, the kitchen boy, who she treats abysmally throughout, going so far as to make him sleep in a hedgerow at one point. And, after he saves her family, Gareth is revealed to be none other than the king's cousin, leaving Lynette to rue her behaviour. To think that she might have married him instead of her sister and been one of the first ladies at court after the queen. But does she learn anything? No chance. She's still horrible to Gareth and she storms off. A moral is a moral though, as long as the audience learns something. 
the characters, I guess, don't really have to. But what then of Merlin trying to make Arthur banish Mordred, son of Morgan Fay from the court, saying that he comes from evil stock? What sort of moral is that? That if your family has done bad things in the past, you yourself are irredeemable? This is certainly pretty dark for a children's book. As is this concept... It was only plain maidens who had difficulty in finding rescuers. A beautiful maiden in distress could count on a flock of gallant knights to come to her rescue. So the moral of that tale is don't be ugly. With that in mind, it's also interesting to consider in 2020 what some people will make of the novel's naked and obvious support for Christianity above all other religions. The good Christian knights always triumph over the wicked, brutish, pagan opponents, or what some people might make of the very pronounced gender divides. Personally, for its time of writing and the time being loosely depicted, I didn't find anything other than interesting, but people offended by such things can consider this their trigger warning. But the one thing that you do associate with knights of honour is that they should treat people with fairness and dignity, and Arthur's knights are not always like that. Both Balin and Bors are routinely humiliated in the courts of England and Ireland. Uh, while in Spain to rescue Isolt from the Moors, Tristram murders a Spanish knight simply because he wants his armour, and Lynette is far from the only one that treats Gareth unkindly. Sir Kay even gives him a woman's name because he's been forced to serve in the kitchens. Further, Merlin announced that one seat at the round table is the seat perilous reserved for the greatest knight in the kingdom. Now you would assume that such a thing in this environment of honour and equality that the seat would remain symbolically empty. Isn't that the purpose of a round table, after all, that all who sit at it are equal? Further, in a Christian kingdom, would not sitting in it or even desiring to be a sign of ambition or possibly the sin of pride? Galahad sits in the seat unaware of its significance. Here we must expect him to then prove his valour, his greatness. But his story is probably the worst in the book. We're simply told he's great and then God takes him to heaven. He doesn't show or earn such favourable treatment. If his story wasn't begun and ended in all of about ten pages, he might even be churning the Mary Sue waters. If you're a teenager, what do you make of these illustrations? They are kind of awful, aren't they? Although I don't judge them particularly harshly because Rebecca Fraser was only 12 when she did them, and I don't know enough about 12-year-olds to say whether they're actually good or not by those standards. But I suspect that young boys and girls presented with these choices are not going to plump for the middle one. Additionally, Lady Antonia has written a novel that is constructed in such a way that it should appeal to younger children, yet the violence, the themes and the language makes it much more suitable for older children who may well be put off by the illustrations and its structure. So who will this novel appeal to? Well, me. I rather liked it, despite everything I've just said. The fights are full of daring and bold men giving their cruel foes their comeuppance. Might might make right, but the brevity of the various tales injects an undeniable verve. And there is a reason that this story has endured and been told so often and become one of our more famous legends. It's a damn fine tale, no matter how you tell it. And who can't be stirred by all that mythology and history spilling off the page like this? Then, with a flourish of trumpets, the host set off for France. It was a brave sight. Helmets gleamed in the sun. The lances shone like a forest of steel. All the noblest crests in Britain were to be seen on the shields, their rich trappings fluttering in the breeze. As the clank-clank of armour mingled with the clopping of hooves, the cries of knights, and the orders of the leaders to make a confusion of sights and sounds which had never been equalled at Camelot. After Arthur rode Sir Lancelot, second to none in splendour, with his horse's mane flowing in the wind and the proud plume of his helmet waving gaily above his head. After him, Sir Gareth, who had won a great reputation in France, Sir Bedivere on a fine charger, Sir Kay, who was never far from the front ranks, Geraint of Devon, who had left Devon to join the king against the Norsemen, Tristram, who had abandoned Cornwall at Arthur's call, and many others whose adventures would fill a score of books. And then from there we come to the final battle where Lady Fraser calls Sir Gawain and Sir Lancelot dueling the saddest sight in Britain. And we can feel some of that. The round table has been split by treachery and jealousy. And for the first time, two knights were fighting against each other instead of side by side. Personally, I might have gone with the parallelism here, fighting each other face to face or sword to sword instead of side by side. But still, it's a powerful moment. And as the end of Arthur's life's work, is quite emotive too. And the final bloody battle has something of the Ragnarok about it, with Arthur and his warriors engaging in desperate battle to save the kingdom and both sides suffering horrendous casualties, with Arthur then borne away at the last by mysterious maidens. It's a rousing and fitting end to that legend, as are the text's final words. Today, over a thousand years later, we are proud to remember that King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table are part of our national heritage. Indeed we are. 
packed with verve, passion and politics and enough bones being crushed and bodies pierced to satisfy even those of us who are far removed from the book's target audience but remain children at heart. Lady Antonia's book is bright and breezy despite its occasionally bizarre style. Usually in closing, I suggest people who might want to enjoy this but I doubt there are too many 12-year-olds or 30-year-olds for that matter who still listen avidly to the bedtime stories. I simply have no idea who will enjoy this book. But I did. That's why The Seagull has its thumbs up. And if I liked it, perhaps you will too. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, now is your last chance to like and subscribe. The boxes on the screen are for other videos of mine that you may enjoy. Perhaps I will see you in one of those.